You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. I'm Garrett Peterson. And today I'm going to be talking with Anton Howes about his new book, Arts and Minds, How the Royal Society of Arts Changed a Nation. Anton, welcome back to Economics Detective Radio. Thanks very much, Garrett. Nice to be back. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to have you. So that last time you were on, it was in 2017, and we discussed um, the Industrial Revolution and, and some work you were doing on it then. Um, how, how about... Mm-hmm. Uh, how about you start uh, this episode by by talking about uh, how, how you came to write a book about the Royal Society? It's a it's a really interesting topic and uh, clear, clearly a, a pivotal sort of force in the de- in creation of the modern world and modern science. Uh, what uh, what got you interested in it? Yeah, so it's sort of an offshoot from my research in the Industrial Revolution, stuff that I'm still continuing to do now. So when we spoke back in 2017, that project that we were talking about is actually the project I'm writing my second book on. Um, But I guess it's a much older, much broader, wider project. So I mean, from that original research, one of the main case studies that I'd used in one of the chapters of, of that work had been looking at the kinds of prizes that were given by the Royal Society of Arts. Now, I should clarify here, there is a difference between the Royal Society which is the famous science-promoting institution with people like Edmund Haley and Isaac Newton and Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke, and the Royal Society of Arts, which in the 17, which was founded a bit later in the 1750s rather than the 1660s, um, and originally didn't have the royal. The royal only comes in 1908. So it's generally speaking, the most of its history called the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures and Commerce or the Society of Arts. But really, these two societies are quite related. So the Royal Society was about promoting science and originally had this idea that in addition to science, it would promote science's application. So not just the theories of how the natural world works, but also what kind of inventions, what kind of innovations would come out of that. But by the 1750s, there was this general perception that the Royal Society wasn't really doing that. And so some of its fellows, uh, people like Stephen Hales, um, James Short, um, and a few others, not that well-known people today, but amongst them, including a few other people who'd had similar ideas, they band together and they set up this new society, the Society of Arts, um, in order to concentrate on the application side of things. So less on the science, more on the usefulness of knowledge and how we can directly apply it to improving industry, improving art, improving design, um, what have you. So the Society of Arts, the subject of my first book, which has just come out a few months ago, or the RSA for sure, the Society of Arts is really about this. I mean, one way of putting it is that it's a it's a kind of general national improvement agency in anything and everything, um, because that's kind of how it was in, in, in originally envisioned, how it was um, originally intended. Um, and then because it's had such a broad remit, you know, arts, manufacturers, commerce, that covers pretty much anything and everything you can think of. Um, over its, the course of its history, it's done all sorts of um, quite exciting, quite random even things. So, okay, so there's two organizations. So the, the Royal Society and the Royal Society of Arts, originally not royal, but uh, uh, eventually came to, to adopt that, that moniker. Um, mm-hmm. Do you want to just, uh, to clarify, um, when, when you say arts, you don't mean fine arts, uh, Let's just uh, clarify some terminology there. Sure, yeah. So art in the 18th century really means it's, it's closer to artifice, right? So anything made by people, made by humans. Um, the arts of man is often the thing that you'll hear um, spoken about. So I guess the, dis- the key distinction here or the key dichotomy here is between nature and art, that which is made by God or made by nature that is Kind of there already before humans and that which is made by humans. And so the Royal Society is about nature and its study, but natural philosophy, as it's often called, the, you know, the older term for what we now call science, um, and art in terms of, so fine art is actually included within that, but it's not just painting and sculpture and architecture. You do have painters and artists and, and, and various other um, sculptors and what have you involved in the Society of Arts and trying to push it in that direction. But you've also got people who are, you know, 
chemists, uh, manufacturers, uh, mechanics, and so on, who are also, or even traders trying to set up new trade routes, um, who are also coming up with um, new, new ways to do things. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's a uh the same usage you see when uh, you know you're at a university and there's the faculty of arts which of course includes more than uh, than uh, than fine art it often <laughs> includes yeah well that's even broader right so liberal arts and you've got the old sciences and arts distinction and um, i guess i think law would come under arts because it's a practice it's rather than just pure theory yeah yeah so i think what what interests me the most about uh about this topic is just how um, I, I think, uh, you know, coming from an economics background, it's easy to see development and growth as sort of uh, impersonal processes, you know, that, that students, uh, we teach students the, you know, the solo growth model where, you know, people just, people save a little bit, to, uh, people have savings and, and those, uh, you know, grow the capital stock, and then with a you know more capital, uh, the the economy produces more and has more savings, and it just kind of uh, you know grows mechanically until it uh, it reaches a plateau. Um, and you know, the, this this story with the the Society of Arts kind of shows how how a lot of development, uh, at least in in the UK during the Industrial Revolution, and and continuing from then how much of it was a deliberate you know effort to Im- of people to improve the world and to and to improve technology and and become you know more productive and just better at doing you know all sorts of things um so so let's uh let's talk about uh the the people who who sort of who founded this and you know who were they and what were their motivations yeah, so I think there's a kind of there's a, there's a there's a few different motivations for its founding. Some of them, as I mentioned, are fellows of the Royal Society who feel a bit of dissatisfaction um, with the way that the, the Royal Society had been going. Um, so Stephen Hales is a great example of this. He's someone who had done a lot with botany, had done a lot with looking at pneumatics, looking at how the air works. Um, and then later on in life starts to think about how he can actually apply his knowledge to invention. Uh, he becomes one of these great serial inventors who's doing anything and everything. You know, my, my, some of my favorite examples of the sorts of things he was doing towards the end of his life would be um, he starts advising ladies to put uh, upside down cups in their teacups, in their pies to stop them boiling over because there'll be a small vacuum formed within them, you know, to, that would prevent the juices from um, falling over, falling out of the pie. Um, or I think he's one of the last things he's ever seen doing is painting various posts along the road white so that they'd be a bit more, a bit more reflective during the night so that people wouldn't, you know, hit themselves, hit their knees on them as they were as they were running by, you know, before street lighting had become a very widespread thing. So you've got someone like Hales who becomes a serial inventor. Um, and I think part of what he's concerned about is that if you just do science on its own, if you just do science um, without justifying its usefulness, then people start to deride it. They start to become skeptical of it and they perhaps become... Um, hostile towards it as well. So, you know, this is at a, at a period in time in the early 18th century, but you're starting to get um, quite a few critiques of the Royal Society. You know, so I mentioned in the book um, that uh, Jonathan Swift has this chapter in Gulliver's Travels where he basically makes fun of the Royal Society members um, as though they're so, you know, up in the head up in the clouds that they're barely able to function um, as human beings. Um, and likewise, you see all sorts of these sorts of critiques of the scientists that that they've been doing all of this science. And yes, great that Britain is doing so well compared to the French in in this and that theory that people have come up with. But people are really looking for things that will affect them in their day to day lives. So one of the things Hales invents in seventeen forties is a ventilator, um, which was not the ventilator as we think of it today as something that you use within a hospital, but more like a kind of early air conditioning system to just have a, an exchange of air to purify, to kind of get fresh air in and distill air out of confined spaces like prisons, jails, ship holds, and so on. 
And because it was widely believed that stale air or bad air was a cause of various diseases like typhus, often called jail fever um, or, pri or prison fever, or even hospital fever because of these confined spaces. Now, that's not actually how it works. It turns out that they're often instead transmitted by fleas um, or by other things like lice. Um, but it turns out that in some ways his invention worked. Um, and I think there are various reasons for this that aren't actually to do with the kind of incidental, accidental reasons that it was somewhat successful. Um, but it's a great example, I think, of the kinds of things that Hales becomes very interested in um, when he starts to hear of these sorts of general plans for a society that'll be about application, um, about encouraging commerce, encouraging invention. So he's immediately thinking of, you know, how can we boost the British Navy? How can we have more naval um, improvements? How can we have more health improvements? You know, these are the sorts of things that are very public interested, very public facing. But really the prime mover, now Hales is very influential, but really the prime mover is a guy called William Shipley, who's often considered the, the founder of the Society of Arts. Um, and what's interesting about him is actually he's a very peripheral figure when it comes to the Republic of Letters. You know, he's not a member of the Royal Society, although he does have a lot of friends who seem to be part of the Royal Society who he draws upon to get this new society founded. But really, he's one of these people who will, you know, collect specimens, who will correspond with, with the natural philosophers, who is engaged in the Republic of Letters, but in more of a kind of, um, lesser way like he's not coming up with grand new theories he's not writing whole new books um, but he's doing that kind of the work at the coal face if you like collecting samples um um having you know transmitting information about local occurrences for example um transmitting in, uh, in information from local chapters you know he's a member of the natural Phil philosophical society at um northampton um, to the, the hub in London. Um, and so I think what happens with him is not only is he a part of these circles, but he becomes very interested in questions of the public good. There, there's, there's this general sense in the 1740s and 50s that things are going a bit wrong, that politicians are too fractious, um, that, the pub, that there's a lot of groups at all levels who don't have the public interest at heart. So at the lowest levels, um, that you've got increasing crime. He talks about vagabonds being on the increase. Um, at the middle level, you've got merchants who are perhaps monopolizing resources at the expense of the poor. And at the highest level, you've perhaps got problems with aristocrats who are spending everything in London, but they're not actually paying attention to their estates out of the country and they're letting them decay. Uh, again, to the, to the harm of the nation, but also, um, poorer people as well. And so in Northampton, one of the things Shipley does, he sets up this scheme to buy up um, fuel cheaper in the summer to then sell it at cost price in the winter to undercut the fuel merchants who he thinks are um, raising prices at the expense of the poor. And he gets what he does is he gets a public subscription of amongst the gentry and you know, the relatively rich people in the area together to pay for this to happen. Um, and that seems to be the model that he uses for the Society of Arts. So rather than just concentrating on this single, very micro local problem, he thinks, well, why don't we just have, why don't we do this on a national scale for anything and everything? And hence the Society of Arts is kind of outgrowth of that model. So wedding this concern for inventions um, to this much broader concern for the public interest as a whole. So then the Society of Arts is a, a private group that, just with with this very sort of broad vision, this broad uh, goal of just general improvement of of the the nation uh, and and technology and uh, many many different sort of areas of life. H how does it get started? Like you know how 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 does it come to to actually exist? And uh, and how how does it function in its early days? Yeah, so this is the interesting thing, because Shipley sets up a society over which he actually doesn't have any control, because in the founding documents, he essentially creates a deliberative direct democracy in which if you're a subscriber, you pay in your two guineas a year or your 20 guineas for a lifetime membership. Um, and then once you're a member, or once you're a subscriber, and nowadays they use the term fellows, again, it's a kind of 20th century thing. But once you become a member, once you become a subscriber, then you have 
it's one person, one vote on literally anything and everything that society does. So as you say, it becomes this general improvement agency. But as to what specifically it does, that's very much just up to the members. Um, so Shipley becomes the first secretary of the society. But what that really means is that he's just the guy who takes the minutes of the meetings. Um, so to get the thing started, what he does is he goes to London in 1753 slash 1754, and he starts canvassing people who are relatively uh, influential. So he meets Stephen Hales properly. He talks to him, gets his support. He talks to a few other people, and he tries to get a critical mass going. Um, what happens, though, is actually by um, after a few months' time, he finds that he's not quite getting as many people signed up as prospective people as, as, as much as he'd hoped. And so he just decides to start the thing, right? Better to start small and grow than to try and, you know, try and go for perfect and, 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 or go for too much at the, at the beginning, but not actually get in, not actually get a thing started. And so what happens is the founding, the founding sequence, if you like, is that 11 men walk into a coffee house in March 1754 and pretty much just declare themselves, I suppose, while sitting around the coffee house table to be the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce. And they decide that they will, you know, they've got two um, members of the nobility amongst them. They decide that, well, that they offer to underwrite the first few prizes that they'll give um, before they've got sufficient subscription funds um, to, to pay out for the prizes later on. Um, and they decide to offer prizes for a bunch of things. So finding a new cobalt mine, because they're concerned about costly imports of cobalt, um, which was used as a pigment for blue, particularly in things like uh, pottery. They put in a prize for the cultivation of madder, which is for a kind of red dye, often used in, in the, the growing textile um, industry. And again, something imported from the Dutch, and they were worried that the Dutch were either adulterating the matter they were selling or just driving up the price because they'd monopolized it as a, as a trade. Um, and also um, drawing prizes for young people. Um, and this again has that sort of slightly mercantilist um, undertone to it as well, where, I mean, it's not like they're lobbying for protectionist laws for higher tariffs, but they are trying to do import substitution very often. And even with the drawing prices for young people, the reason behind that is to eventually be able to outcompete the French when it comes to design. Um, so those are the first three that they think, you know, these are relatively low hanging fruit, I suppose, that, that they thought they could encourage with the use of these prizes. But what happens over time is over the first hundred years or so, it gives many thousands of prizes, you know, four polite arts, four inventions, at least 2000 for various kinds of inventions. It gives prizes for growing trees, which that were to be used for the Navy because they were concerned that trees were being cut down for fuel all the time, or again, that they were being imported from the Baltic, which made them a kind of an issue of national security. So I guess timber security was a major issue um, for the British in the 1760s and 70s, and you know, even later too. Um, and so all of these prizes are coming from, you know, just the members who happen to sign up. And so what's interesting about the Society of Arts after this point is that it becomes, if you like, a kind of reflection of what the elites in London think, what their priorities are, what their concerns are. You know, we don't have any polling from that period, but if you want to know what the kind of typical civil servant, politician, MP, merchant, um, as a group, in London thought throughout those first hundred years. I think the society, especially in those first few decades, the society is a pretty good um, way of capturing some of their opinions or their concerns about what the public good needed. Mm -hmm. So, so the, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, it was, uh, I believe a two guinea entry fee, uh, you know, give, give me a sense of how much money that was. It's, it's not like, you know, uh, it's not something that just anyone could afford, presumably. Yeah. So it's interesting. It's very difficult, as you know. I'm sure. I'm sure you've discussed this with others. Have to compare inflation uh, or to, to have real rates over over time. I mean, there's at least three or four different ways in which you can do it, and they come up with wildly, wildly different uh, figures when you try to compare it to the present day. Um, partly that's because just the quality of things has changed, but also you've got to bear in mind inequality. So two guineas for someone in the middle or upper classes isn't actually that much. Um, but for someone who's, you know, working class labourer or something, that's a huge amount of money, uh, absolutely staggering amount of money. 
Um, so yeah, two guineas is a kind of, I would say it's expensive. Uh, one of the better inflation calculations or ways of saying it is it's about £2,000 in today's money. But bearing in mind that some people were very, very rich. And so those were generally the sorts of people who became members. So for them, two guineas seems quite afford- affordable in a way that, you know, if I said, can you, you want to join the society for £2,000 a year? You're probably going to tell me, ah, you know, even though, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a bit, that's a bit much. Um, and I, what I would say is maybe one way of to think about it is that it's £2,000 for a labourer, but it's more like £200 if you're in the middle class at the time. Right? So I think there's a, there's a real difficulty in calculating it, but that's what I would say is roughly what it is. And what's interesting, actually, is that what happens is that the two guineas remains the rate pretty much right up until the early 20th century um, because the members never never vote for it to become higher. And so what you have is actually the membership of the Society of Arts got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as you've got more and more inflation. Um, and then it's only really in the mid-20th century that they started pegging it to inflation so it would keep up with it. And it's a bit under £200, I think, last time I checked. Um, so it's kind of maintained itself, um, I think, along that, that, that period, although, of course, inequality has become much less stark since the 1750s. Right. So, so when you say it's, uh, you know, that the, the opinions of the, uh, the society are, um, reflective of, of the elites, it, it's, uh, it reflects the fact that, um, the, the entry fee was something that was out of reach of, of, of someone who was working class, but, uh, well within reach of, uh, of, you know, it's uh, someone from the nobility or, or a successful merchant or, you know, uh, someone in the, uh, the wealthier classes of society. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what's interesting, actually, is if you look at what the prizes that were on, on offer were, you know, some of the very lower ones are about five guineas, um, but they get as high as 50 guineas. So if you put that in the context of how much the fee is, if you're a, a relatively poor inventor winning this 50 guinea prize, that's a huge windfall, you know, add the three zeros to it for someone who's from from that kind of lower um, lower classes, and and that's a really really big prize. Although it's nowhere close to how much they might potentially get if they were to commercialize it fully with a patent. But then actually, a patent might be extremely um, expensive for them to acquire in the first place. So I mean, that's the other interesting thing is for this first hundred years, the society. And this is one of the reasons I looked at it originally as a project is that the Society of Arts gave prizes to non-patented inventions, something that it very quickly within the first few years formalizes as a rule. And there's various reasons for that um, as well. So part of it, I think, is to do with this distrust of monopolizers, right? It's about, um, there's this worry about the, the kind of private greed of, of merchants and monopolists um, being at the expense of the public. Um, but actually, I think a lot of it's really to do with the fact that um, they don't want to be encouraging the sorts of things that already get encouragement. So if something is worth a patent, given how expensive a patent at the time was, given how much effort it took, there's no point to you encouraging that thing with your prize system. You want to be encouraging the stuff that hasn't already been done. So very often there are a few cases in my kind of that I cite in the book, but or that I draw upon to make that claim, which is that there are a few cases where they discover that someone has a patent for a process. And what they either do is they specify that it must not be along this same method or they just withdraw the advertisement for that particular prize because they're like, well, clearly this is already being done. Yeah, so I, I've I've read a lot about uh, you know the the industrial revolution and and sort of some of the innovations. And you had people, you know, the sort of Richard Arkwrights uh, and and you know people in, innovating, and they would they would invent some new process. And a lot of the time, you know, they'd get their patent and they'd they'd start their their own, you know, business, the, uh, you know, in, uh, may, maybe, uh, processing textiles or, or something using this process that they patented. And, uh, until the patent expired, they, they kind of fight to, to keep others from, from doing what they did. Right. They, they wanted, uh, you know, just, just the, that's kind of the idea of a patent that, you know, you get, uh, you know, a monopoly rent, uh, for how, however long it lasts. Uh, I think, uh, I, I'm not sure. Were they 20 year patents at that time? Uh, 14 typically. Yeah. And so, and so that was the reward 
uh, you know, that the built-in sort of legal reward for for innovation. You you had 14 years where you had the best, um, you know, uh, carding engine or or whatever, um, and and you could you could produce things more efficiently. But the issue is that you know people couldn't. Um, you know, you could only you could only run so many so many textile mills. You can only run so large a business with your technology, and so it what didn't it didn't necessarily uh, have a, a big impact on on you know on the whole country on the whole industry, you know, until the patent expired. And so and so, you know, having this sort of alternative where you come up with an innovation and you get a prize, but then everyone can use the technology right away is is very desirable but it takes some some kind of someone public minded to uh to put up the prize um and it's it's really it's really quite remarkable that uh that they did this and they they put up their own money not uh they didn't they didn't have to use use uh you know public funds they they put up their own money for all these innovations yeah it's a, it's a privately funded thing i mean the other context of course here is that the state did very little um when it came to things like innovation in general, unless it had a direct bearing on warfare. Um, so you do get, for example, subsidies for hemp, which is used in rope making. Um, you get subsidies for things like the various other kinds of um, commercial products or agricultural products that they thought might be of great use. Um, and sometimes the societies. Uh, you know, the society itself would actually supplement those subsidies. So when they have subsidies for hemp, the Society of Arts also kind of adds to it by using the funds. So rather than just encouraging invention, they, they try to kind of supplement the government subsidies of things. Although it turns out, you know, as, 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 as you might expect, that those turn out to be not very good value for money, right? So coming up with an invention that improves the cultivation of hemp is much better than and much cheaper to reward than coming up with a subsidy where you pay absolutely every farmer who's you know done so and so many acres um, for a certain amount that they produce. Um, so they, 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 it's interesting because they do have a few of these cases where perhaps some of their members felt the government hadn't done enough, and so they used the society as their vehicle to try and supplement it using the accumulated funds that it had. Um, the other interesting thing to, well, I mean, the other thing I should note though is that. If you patented something in this period, you could still license it to others. So there are cases where it can get more widespread than just the patentee monopolizing it. But of course, you do have the payment for the license and you do have the kind of restrictions over it. Um, you know, it is actually a, a principle of, of English law that, that you, you shouldn't just monopolize it entirely just to yourself, at least earlier on. Although the extent to which that's actually enforced is obviously very variable. Actually, the enforcement of patents in general could be very variable as well. A lot of people have, they do choose to try and enforce their patents, have a lot of trouble enforcing it in, in law courts, um, or even just collecting the information necessary to bring an infringement case. And um, so it's a very risky um, system, though one that is, is used with increasing frequency, especially from the 1760s. Whereas the Society of Arts is interesting as, a, as an alternative. You're right. Um, not only because it provides this completely different route, but it also appeals to slightly different kinds of invention and different kinds of inventor. So what you see is a lot of people winning prizes or uh, uh, going for prizes who are very poor. You see people who are very rich, um, who perhaps want to be known as public spirited individuals. So they're not even going for the cash prizes, they're going for honorary medals. Um, so you know, what do you, how do you appeal to someone who is already too rich to bother with 50 guineas? For whom that's a pittance, well, you offer them a gold medal from a duke or something, right? Um, where they can talk about it to their friends and show off their medal, and you can you can appeal to their sense of prestige, to their sense of honour. At the same time, you also get people who are perhaps in the middle, um, but who are inventing things that aren't worth patenting. So it could be because that invention is too trivial, or it could be that you have the sorts of invention that they think should just be for the public good. So you get cases of People who have patented other inventions, but will, for example, not patent, but you know, give to the, the nation as a whole, give to the nation the invention of something that might be a safety improvement for consumers, for producers, that could be about um, saving the lives of shipwrecked mariners or preventing people from drowning, um, that sort of thing. Right? So there's all sorts of different prizes in, in that case, in, in that of that kind. Um, or you've got the sorts of things that aren't necessarily patentable. 
Um, so agricultural techniques, for example, you, that's a very difficult thing to patent, if, if at all possible. Right? The patent system, you know, it, it is potentially able to cover certain things like that, but that's extremely rare. And by the 1750s, I think it's almost unheard of. So agricultural techniques is one of them. Um, but also things like, for example, um, semaphore systems, you know, signaling systems between ships. There's all sorts of different prizes given in the 1790s and early 1800s for that sort of thing as well. As well as it appealing to the kinds of people who perhaps aren't professional inventors, but have an inventive turn of mind when it comes to other things. So some of those semaphore systems are coming from people who are naval commanders, you know, admirals and so on who perhaps in their government job aren't necessarily going to go out of their way to commercialize something like this, e even if they could. Um, but they want to get that recognition. They might want to get that cash prize or they might want to get that medal um, for their innovation, um, as well as using the society as a vehicle to actually get the, the use of their invention spread around the country right? because it's publicizing um, the invention, right? So you, you would typically have to deposit the, the, a, a model or, or at least a drawing um, at the society, if you visit the society as a member, you could go and have a go on the models and see them and draw them and so on. Um, but also from the 1780s, they start publishing transactions very regularly, just showing you here are all the things that we've given prizes for. Here's exactly how they work. Here's the, the engraving that you can use to copy these things as well yourself. Um, although there are a few earlier cases of them trying to publicize things, but it's kind of not as regular as they, they do with the transactions. Yeah, so so the I mean that's that's a really interesting function right there, just spreading uh, the ideas because you know knowledge and ideas are these these non rivalrous goods that can uh, you know potentially uh, Im you know improve many people's lives or, or many you know uh, processes, um, but you know people have to hear about them somehow, um, and you know if you've got a patent and you like. As you mentioned, you might want to to sell people a license. Then you you yourself have a have a um, an incentive to to sort of spread spread the word. But something that is is hard to patent, or you know, just very hard to um, you know, or something you just don't want to patent. Someone someone has to let people know about this new uh, new way of stopping sailors from drowning, and you know maybe. You might not, you know, an individual inventor might not have those resources. Um, so there's there's tremendous value in in not just the creation of the idea, but uh, but the proliferation of of good ideas that uh, that can that you know may, maybe maybe they're immediately obviously valuable when you hear them, but uh, but not uh, not obvious until you hear them. Yeah. So there's the I think there's a few dimensions to that as well. So you've got. You know, a lot of these things are things that are valuable to the public, but they're not necessarily profitable to individuals, right? And so you definitely want to have them, you want to solve that, that positive externality problem by having them diffused in this way. The other, the other thing to bear in mind, though, of course, is that both patents and prices have the effect not just of, but not necessarily, I actually think it's very rare for them to incentivize innovation itself as an activity. But what they do do is that they make it worthwhile to reveal information about the inventions. Um, so a patent allows you, know, very often when people appeal to the patent, especially in the early days when it's just the sort of privilege that you would apply for, you would petition the monarch for, um, rather than a kind of right that you might expect it uh, more likely. When it's just a privilege that people petition for, very often it's something that they've already invented in the past, but they, they're loath to actually make it public. And so they get the patent protection so that they can then publish a book about that, in, that, that invention. Um, they can make those those secrets public. And it's the same with the prizes. So you know, in the early days, they're kind of talking, some of the founding documents or the ones that they refer to talk about this idea that you've got all sorts of inventions all the time, but they're not building upon one another. You're not seeing this cumulative kind of improvement where one invention leads to another improvement on top of it. Instead, you're seeing a lot of reinvention, which is extremely wasteful from society's point of view, where someone's inventing something, and then they don't bother to tell anyone because they keep it secret to try and monopolize the use of that invention because they don't have any other sorts of protections um, or because they're worried that they're not going to be able to recoup their losses from the kind of experimental period of creating those inventions. Um, and then because they haven't revealed it, that thing is forgotten. and Someone has to basically go and reinvent that thing, the society as a whole, to get that cumulative improvement. 
And so very often the early society's prizes are sort of envisioned, not as necessarily inducements to invent, but inducements to make those inventions public. Um, it's a bit, a bit like purchasing secrets, if you like, um, is kind of the, the main way to think about it. Um, and so I think, you know, and you often see that in the way that they do the application system for the prize is that very often the invention should actually have been at work already. And so in order to get the invention, often what the inventors are doing is not only are they submitting models, um, but sometimes they'll maybe get a bit like a kind of reference letter from their local clergyman or from their neighbors or from some of the, even from some, some of their competitors or their customers saying that this invention works in the way that they're claiming it works in order to, to gain the prize. Yeah, I, I know from your, your other writings, uh, you, you've written about uh, alchemy as kind of a precursor to, to modern chemistry and how uh, people were very secretive. You know, they would experiment with different uh, substances and try to, uh, you know, try to, uh, the classic one is try to turn lead into gold, which of course you couldn't do, but they'd make other discoveries, but then they would be held, held you know, very close, close to the chest you know they would not uh they would not share with each other in the way that uh you know a, a modern uh chemist writes a you know makes a discovery and then writes a, a an academic paper um sharing it with all the other chemists uh that that was that was not a a part of uh of of science or or technology uh until until later and until groups like uh, the Society of Arts uh, really encourage that. Yeah, and I think that's a key thing, even with the Royal Society earlier, is trying to make it much more public, much more publicized, um, where you can have groups of people looking at these ideas, establishing what's fact and what's not. Um, I mean, some, some historians of science even argue that that kind of socializing process is where you get the invention of the fact as a thing. Right, is that this kind of commonly accepted knowledge? You know, a bit like how in you know, Game of Thrones people would say it is known. You know, that's actually a very bold claim. How do you actually establish what is known in the same way that today in a lot of academic literature people use the passive tense as though this thing is just happens to be? We know that this is true, and I can take it as an axiom. Establishing those facts is a very social process, so it does require these sorts of institutions to establish them. Yeah. So tell. Tell me more. Uh, are there are there any uh, particularly interesting um, prizes that uh, you know that sort of illustrate the kind of things the Society of Arts was was doing and what they cared about? Yeah. So one of the ones I mentioned a bit earlier was was prizes for growing trees. So one of the problems with trees is that in order for them to be be usable by the British Navy, they have to be pretty old. So an oak is only really ready for shipbuilding when it's about 80 to 120 years old. And it depends on the kinds of the shape of it, it depends on the kinds of bits of the ship you're going to use it for and so on. Um, and there's other trees that you might use as well. So I think I called correctly things like elm that are pretty good for the keel. Um, there's all sorts of other ones that you can use for the planking as well. But oak is one of the, really one of the main ones. And not just any oak, but for certain types of uh, parts of the ship, you're going to need oak that has grown in a very particular way, what's often called compass timbers, um, where, you know, think of those oaks where they kind of don't just grow up and out, but they kind of go off at particularly weird angles and so on, because sometimes you need that, that angle to be part of the timber itself so it's strong enough, for example, to, to hold um, the rudder. A very a very heavy piece that you're going to need this kind of um, tensile strength within um, the shape of within the grain of the wood itself. Given that problem of how long it takes to do these things, right? How how do you like, think of it from this point of view? How do you go about incentivizing people to not cut down this stuff for fuel, or not cut cut the stuff the stuff down too early for other sorts of uses, but perhaps building buildings of some kind? Um, in order to get around this problem. So the, the main appeal they have is, is that they, they know that the, the key people to appeal to here are the aristocracy, right? It's on their landed estates that you're going to be able to potentially get all of these forests being planted. Um, but you can't appeal to them in monetary terms because they're extremely rich and wealthy already. So you appeal to them in prestige terms um, by trying to make them very public and publicized patrons of the nation is a really good way of putting it. 
but also you're you're trying to appeal to this sense that they're not just doing this for the short term but for the very very long term that you know they may die but their heirs and their heirs heirs are going to be able to say look here's the tree that they planted 120 years ago that we can now use for these the new ships now that we've got i don't know napoleon or something to fight um, and then the other way they do it is they they look at substitutes um, so they try to encourage the planting of more quick or fast growing trees um, which could be cut down for fuel instead of the oaks and so they don't just so they, although they start off with just this idea of let's just sow a lot of acorns over this many acres and whoever does the most acres gets the prize or whoever plants the most trees or gets them to this level of maturation gets gets the prize that year um, let's also have institute other other prizes for substitutes as well so i think that's a really for me that's a very interesting particularly interesting um, case of their their use of prizes where there's actually a lot of thought goes into the economics of tree planting the kinds of incentives that people generally faced in order to plant um, trees, especially for such a long-term problem. Um, so that's one that I think is worth mentioning. In terms of inventions, um, a lot of them, as I mentioned, are uh, safety improving. One of my favorites, and I think this one really especially stands out to a lot of people, is a prize for replacing the use of child labor in chimney sweeping. So a technological replacement to take children's jobs because very often kids sometimes as young as four even are being you know potentially abducted or you've got kind of got these abusive relationships with the master sweeps adults um, who are sending these kids up to essentially a very very horrible short-term lives very early deaths um where you know they get all sorts of cancers from the soot um they can die in accidents in the chimneys themselves there are cases apparently of you know, a, a kid being up there and someone setting the fire underneath them accidentally without realizing they were still in there. And so, you know, essentially burning, roasting them alive. Um, and also, if you had a fire that was taking place in the flu, um, you would send up a small boy with a damp rag to try and put it out. And so coming up with a tangible replacement is one of the things that the society does. It, 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 some of its members cooperate with another society called the Society for Superseding the Necessity of Climbing Boys, and it's the short version of the title, um, to institute this prize for something that will just be a machine that will do this instead. Um, and it's very quickly won. Um, and then you have this whole campaign about how do you actually get people to adopt this machine? So they face resistance from the master sweeps. Um, they start, they give loads of free ones to the master sweeps, and then the master sweeps misuse them on purpose. Um, to try and get turn customers against the use of the machines, and so they have to adopt slightly different tactics um, to try and um, undercut them. So what they do is they start selling directly to the housekeepers, so they would do it themselves um, rather than employing a sweep. So they start to compete with them in that way. Um, they use the funds from that separate society, although it has a lot of members in common, the SSNCB. Um, to actually fund the prosecution of the chimney sweeps who are breaking some of the laws that they're then able to get past because that technological replacement exists. Right. So one of the key barriers that you had to banning the use of child chimney sweeps is people would just say, well, what are you going to do instead? We're not going to be able to just mandate the use of slightly um, less narrow or less bendy flues because those have these thermodynamic um, properties where they conserve heat and they, they draw fire a bit better um, and also it's just going to be extremely costly to change all of the chimneys throughout the entire country um, and so because they don't have the and when they get that replacement suddenly they can say well look we found a way that we can use instead of kids so now we can go about banning their use yeah so to to be clear the these chimneys they were they were too small for an adult to fit in them and so you it it wasn't just like, you know, we don't have enough labor, so make the kids work. It was, this is a job that literally only a child or a very small adult can do. That's right. Um, and we don't have a ton of very small adults. So, so you know, the, the children must must work or we can't have these, these efficient uh, chimneys that uh, we rely on for so many things. You know, from a modern perspective, you look back and, and you go, oh, you know, how could they have sent their children to, you know, in, to work in this awful way? And... You know, it's 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 easy to say that from the perspective of someone who, uh, you know, one has has all these alternative technologies that don't require children to to do this kind of work, 
but also we were just a much wealthier society. You know, we could, uh, if we had to, we could make do with, uh, you know, some efficiency loss. Uh, but, uh, but we, we have a lot of, a lot of buffer, right. Between us and, uh, you know, starvation or, or, you know, being destitute that, uh, that earlier people didn't necessarily have. Um, but, but yeah, so the, the, the society of arts, uh, you know, first had a, a prize for a machine that could do this work. And tell me a little bit about the machine. It's, it's like a, a, a brush on a, on an arm that you can kind of maneuver into, into the chimney. I mean, yes, it does involve a brush, of course, but it's a, um, it's a bit like, um, imagine how tent pegs, not tent pegs, but you know, the, the poles that you use for putting up a tent mm-hmm. and they'll have the cord down the middle down the center of the the poles and you sort of slot the poles together and then there's a kind of cord down the middle so imagine instead that you're putting you've got a kind of brush um at the top and then you kind of as you you at the at the bottom of the chimney you start pushing up these poles clicking them together and then once you've pushed the thing right up to the top of the chimney you can then pull the cord down the center of all of these poles uh, which are slotted together and then the brush is able to open from having pulled the cord, and then you just pull the whole thing down all the way back down. And so the brush, having widened from pulling the cord, now brushes all the way down um, the chimney along all of the kind of sides of it. Whereas before, you know, to push it up, you needed it to be much more narrow. Um, and that's kind of, it's a very simple thing, really. It's actually kind of one of these, one of my favorite cases of something that really could have been invented quite a bit earlier. Um, but I guess one of the roles that the society had there was just in calling attention to the problem and that there could be a technological solution to it rather than just assuming this is just a social problem um, that needs to be dealt with in a kind of social way by, I don't know, you know, some of the early laws trying to regulate the use of children in chimney, uh, chimney sweeps isn't necessarily trying to ban their use, but trying to just improve their conditions, um, how much they paid, how are they treated by the masters and so on. Again, very difficult thing to do, but really coming up with this technological replacement has a much more fundamental effect once they're able to spread its use. Mm-hmm. I, I'm reminded of the, the people today trying to trying to create uh, alternatives to, to factory farmed meat products. You know, they, they, they're kind of looking at all the, all the chickens who, are, who suffer to, to bring us meat and, and they're thinking, can, you know, can we make an alternative uh, that, uh, you know, that, makes it makes it so a so you can have the sort of flavor and nutritional value of chicken without uh without a chicken having to suffer and yeah that's a great analogy for it yeah i think that's very very much like it in terms of the i guess if you had the society of arts i mean this still exists as as an organization does very different things now but if it were doing something similar i can imagine that being amongst the kinds of prizes that it would put on offer is come up with a certain thing that, you know, we've got, I don't know, people are concentrating on hamburgers, let's have a prize for, I don't know, hot dogs or something. Mm-hmm. And and just, you know, like there there have been some some people who, who care about factory farming and, and kind of, they want to push everyone to become vegan, which is, is just, it's just not, not feasible. You know, people are just not going to go for that unless there's an alternative, just just like with these, these chimney sweeps, you know, the the alternative is so important, uh, you know, that, that you show people that they can, uh, they can, uh, go without child chimney sweeps and still have chimneys. Actually, it's interesting. You should mention the food one, because actually there was a prize very similar to it during the great Irish famine. So one of the key problems was that, you know, during the famine, you have this grain you have potato shortage, but you also have a grain shortage. And so one of the things that the society gives a prize for is trying to come up with tasty um, bread that can be made from other kinds of things that were just available, um, other organic matter um, that was edible. Um, so you've got lots of moss in Ireland all over the place. Um, but can you eat that moss? Well, turns out you can try. Um, and so they have this prize, which is won eventually by a Dublin baker um, for a kind of bread where I think in the mixture is things like various local moss or lichen. I think you have some of the corn um, that was being imported from the United States. Um, because, one of the, again, one of the problems there is that you have all this cornmeal being imported, but actually the locals don't really know how to make this a tasty bread. 
um, something that they'll not only be able to eat, but you know, be able to eat safely and be able to eat in a way that's that's actually um, enjoyable for them to eat. And, and actually, that's part of the one of the one of the problems that you have at the time, in amongst all of the other policy failures, is um, this difficulty of persuading people to eat this alternative thing that they're so unused to. And so it's actually kind of funny that in the minutes of the Society of Arts, you have them. There's this very detailed description of them doing the taste test on all of the different loaves made by different bakers and other people who had been experimenting with these cheaper kind of locally sourced um, alternatives. And, you know, it literally kind of goes just disgusting, even more disgusting, passable, you know, just about bearable. And then they finally find they're like, actually, this one's pretty tasty. We'll give this one the award. That's really interesting because, you know, as you mentioned, you know, that that famine was a huge policy failure on the on the part of uh, the British government. But uh, but this private, you know, altruistic society was was uh, was there pushing, uh, you know, pushing technologies and developments that could could help. Yeah. And pushing it in its own way. One of the tricky things, of course, is trying to work out how much of an impact the society did have through these inventions. That's very difficult to quantify because you know the nature of inventions is they're so quickly superseded you can't always tell what's what's happened. But I suspect you know in amongst all of those thousands that have got them, there are some pretty interesting and very fundamental ones in amongst them. And they do give a prize in the eighteen twenties for um, the first electromagnet. So you know there are actually some pretty world changing inventions in amongst the ones that were much more specific to their local context. Wow. Okay. That. Yeah. And of, of course, you know, electromagnets are are in everything now. They're Absolutely, they're yeah. very important technology that without which, you know, most of our modern world could not function. So so um so do do you want to um t- tell me a little bit about you know a- as you mentioned the society still exists today. You know how how did it uh, grow grow and change from its uh, initial founding to uh, to what it became in in the modern age. Yeah, so it's an interesting organization because, of course, it has this very broad remit, right? So in the first hundred years, it is essentially a premium or prize-giving society. It advertises prizes, it gives out those prizes. Most of the work of the members day-to-day or week-to-week, you know, at their Wednesday weekly meetings, and then also for committees that any member could attend, most of that is working out what should we advertise for next, Given the submissions we've had, which ones should we award the prizes to? And this is, again, something just the members themselves decided upon. You've got people like Benjamin Franklin, for example, deciding which of the uh, colonial prizes or co- you know colonies or trade-related prizes or which of the mechanical prizes should be given um, and so on and so forth. And then in the 18... Well, by the 1840s, it's gone into a bit of decline, I guess because a lot of its meetings are really this sort of committee work because of new societies and more specialized societies on more specialized types of knowledge, think just chemistry in, in isolation or agriculture in isolation, because you've got all these new societies emerging, the Society of Arts has this problem of competing for its members' time. People, I think, prefer the kind of infotainment of going to a presentation on the latest advances in agriculture than they do to going to the Society of Arts in the evening and spending all their days um, debating whether or not so and so prize from Mr. Smith from West Exeter or whatever is, is, is going to get the gold or the silver prize or maybe the bronze one, you know, or is, is he going to get 20 guineas or 50? Um, and so you have this competition partly as a result of the society itself being successful and kind of having these other societies actually coming out from the meetings of its own members very often. Um, in many ways, the study of arts is a mother of societies spawning these new, more specialized groups, but then it becomes a victim of its own success in that regard. And so one of the big changes you get in the 1840s is that in order to reform it, it becomes uh, a representative democracy that the members elect a council to deal with most of these things. But also, in a kind of more qualitative way, it shifts more towards not using prizes so much, although it still occasionally uses them throughout the rest of the 19th century. But more to doing things that are kind of what you might call pushing for reforms, pushing for system changes. So, for example, there's the big patent reform of 1852, which is the first major legislation on the patent system um, since the 17th century, early 17th century. Um, and that's more or less something that they themselves push for. And some of their members are instrumental in writing the law that gets passed. 
in order to reform the entire system. And part of that is about making it cheaper, making it much more like the American system, um, where you've got fewer of the bits that are based on the old privileges and petitioning for privileges from the monarch, um, and where it's actually more about encouraging innovation uh, in general. Likewise, you've got them uh, campaigning for copyright reform in the 1860s, trying to add artistic copyright, um, photographic copyright um, to what was mainly just something for engravers um, and for authors. Um, likewise, you've got all sorts of other system changes where, for example, in the 1860s, 60s, they get very obsessed with trying to come up with a uniform standard musical pitch. A lot of people kind of take for granted that the pitch of various musical instruments has a uniform international standard. That wasn't the case. In fact, before the mid 19th century, you could go, you could be in one church in one village, uh, uh, in one city, let's say one part of the city, and then go right down the street to another church. Um, and if you compared the organs, their pitches would, would be completely different. Uh, which becomes a bit of a problem if you're trying to, you know, organize choirs that will tour the country and use different instruments in different locations, right? How do you, how do you adjust the pitches for the, how you, as singers, you're going to have to constantly be adjusting. Um, so coming up with these sorts of regularizing uniform, unif the sorts of reforms that make things more uniform and more systematic becomes part of it. I think what happens is that in the 1840s and 50s, you get this takeover by utilitarian reformers people who are seeking that kind of rationalization of systems, people who are seeking um, greater uh, uniformity in rules and regulations, um, but also systemic changes. And so in some ways, the society becomes this uh, platform for lobbyists in that regard. Um, but one of the main achievements in the 1850s is the Great Exhibition of 1851, the first of the world's fairs. Um, and again, this is a kind of alternative to the price system is that they see that one of the ways to encourage invention is not just to reward things, but again, it's through information ch sharing. If you were to put all of the inventions from all over the world in particular um, categories um, in the same room, so let's say all of the text, all of the textile machinery from all over the world in the same room, you could compare like with like and the inventors can see or the manufacturers can see who's ahead and who's behind and what needs to be done by those behind to catch up. And what are the latest things that, what are the latest avenues for improvement? Um, and likewise, from the consumer's perspective, they can look at what's available to them in terms of the latest designs or the latest machinery and ask, well, why don't our domestic producers um, create this? Why don't we get our local producers to also provide us with this? Or if they're unable to, why don't we try and lobby for the kinds of reforms, free trade reforms that will allow us to import those things from abroad? So the great exhibition is utilized by these utilitarian reformers as this kind of engine of free trade, um, also this engine of better taste amongst consumers, exposing them to the best of what's out there so they don't settle for less. Um, you know, you, people don't know um, what they like until they've seen what they could like, right? It has this kind of advertising or consumer education function, but also this manufacturing education function, this a kind of engine um, for invention at the same time. And so for the rest of the 19th century, they get very involved with more of these world's fairs, either just organizing the British sections at these ones, but you know, they were the main organizers of the Great Exhibition, or many of its members were. Um, and so it was, becomes a Society of Arts project that they then becomes more official over time, and they hand it over to a Royal Commission um, to, to, to manage the, the kind of over, over general parts of it. Um, and then they themselves organize another one in 1862. Um, another, the, the London International Exhibition, which is actually slightly larger, has just over 6 million people visiting it. Um, the Great Exhibition had about 6 million on the dot, more or less. Um, and so they're involved with keeping that kind of industrial competition alive, um, keeping the world's fairs both as engines of free trade and as a result, engines of peace. Right? Because the idea is that if you, you know, this is the kind of old Richard Cobden idea and actually it goes back even further as well that the more you have merchants mercantile links or commercial links between different nations the less likely they are to go to war with one another okay so so the so the society you know goes from mainly a prize granting sort of society to one that uh, that does you know political advocacy and advocates reforms it's interesting we we started talking about uh uh, how how prizes and patents were sort of these substitutes it for for technological development. It's interesting that the the 
the Society of Arts then uh, was instrumental in changing the patent system, uh, sort of a, a you know a, a meeting of these these two different uh, intersection of of this this organization with with both methods for encouraging technological development. Well, I like to say that the society in its first hundred years is a bit more like, is treating prices more as a complement to the patent system rather than a substitute for it. So certainly the rules kind of infer that there's a substitution effect there. But actually, I think it's it's seeing it as you know, where the patent system fails, it wants to do the bits that kind of cover those failures um, or the kind it covers the kinds of inventions that the patent system wouldn't ordinarily um, do rather than trying to say, here's prize instead of getting a patent. Right? I think it's more that if a patent is able to be done for something, they want to fill the gaps. Like filling in the gaps is actually a really nice way of pretty much summarizing the history of the society of arts. And this, this goes on later as well, because, you know, in the 20th century, it gets involved, you know, I mentioned musical pitch. It also is involved in the 1860s, um, with a campaign to, this is a really ingenious one, a campaign to, um, essentially defund the standing army by having a volunteer force instead in the 1860s. The idea being that if they were to, able to have this huge popular volunteer force, um, they would ins- the government would instead be able to spend its money not on the military, um, but on arts, science, commerce, you know, museums, public institutions, and so on. And so, I mean, it doesn't work, obviously, because this, the UK continues to have this. A standing army after that, but the what they do as their kind of more more targeted focus there is to try and encourage the use of a military drill in schools. Um, so you know, having kids parade up and down, um, combined cadet forces in in Canada or the UK or various of the Commonwealth countries kind of have similar systems, I guess, where you know kids will do a bit of military drill, and the idea is you teach them various. Um, skills as part of that. But the idea really was to popularize the use or try to get um, the elites to buy into this idea of having these popular volunteer forces all, all around the country. Um, so that's one of their ingenious plans that they tried to affect in the 1860s, um, 1860s and 70s. And then, you know, you've got all of these random things. And so in the 1920s, for example, they get very involved with the um, dis- well, they're very worried about the destruction of old Tudor and medieval cottages all over the country. And so at one point, they actually set up a fund um, with which they then buy pretty much the entire village of West Wickham in Buckinghamshire to then restore it and put it in a, a more habitable um, state so that it could then be conserved. And eventually it's handed over to the National Trust. Um, likewise, in the 1960s, they get very involved with the birth of um, British environmentalism. Um, which hadn't really existed as a movement before. There's a series of conferences that they helped to organize, you know, really functioning as sort of platform for others or, or affecting change through bringing various voices together and seeing what happens um, rather than doing a more hands-on sort of project, which a lot of their other projects would have been like, you know, things like holding these military drill reviews for lots of different schools in the 1870s or actually organizing the fund that they would use to to, to purchase villages and old Tudor and uh, medieval cottages. So it gives a flavor, I think, of the randomness of the, the various different projects that it gets involved. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, and I mean, that's sort of, you know, it go, you, you mentioned it goes from a direct democracy to a representative democracy, but it really, you know, in in principle, if, uh, if the members decided to, that they care about something uh, and they wanted to vote for it, it the, there's, there's no limits on on what this uh society could be be directing its efforts to beyond beyond that uh sort of popular opinion among its members so it uh so it you know of course of course it gradually changed yeah even today when you've got a bit of insulation from that because it has a more of a kind of ordinary charity structure now um but even then you've got agms and the members can vote on certain things at the AGMs and they have a say in who gets put on the board of trustees and so on. So it's evolved a bit even beyond that, that representative democracy stage. Um, so I guess in some ways it's harder, in some ways it's easier perhaps to influence it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're running up on time. Uh, do you have any closing uh, thoughts, any sort of general takeaways that uh, you think someone who's listened to this conversation should come away with? 
Yeah, I think one of the key lessons for me from this book was that really individuals or very, very small groups of people could have this extraordinary outsized effect on the world. Um, you know, very often these are just kind of, you know, one of the most influential people in the whole book is a guy called Henry Cole, one of these utilitarian reformers, who's basically just a lowly civil servant who I think has had a huge effect on British history um, in terms of the creation of um, its museum system after the Great Exhibition, in, in terms of holding the Great Exhibition, all of the huge effects that occur in the mid and late 19th century as a result of it, cultural effects, as well as getting involved with all these other reforms and campaigns. You know, many of the ones I mentioned from the mid 19th century are really his, his campaigns that he then uses the society to do. But, you know, he's just an individual. He just, through either force of personality or really just from, I guess, being organized and having this confidence that he's able to use an organization like the Society of Arts, you can really do a lot, for better or worse, but you can really do a lot. Um, so I dedicated the book at the beginning to, to the public spirited, because really, you know, even the creation of the Society of Arts, you know, ultimately William Shipley, the founder, as I mentioned, was this very peripheral figure. It's not like he was a great scientist or a famous person or even especially rich. And yet he created an institution that has changed the country, if not the world, uh, that has lasted almost 300 years um, just through a bit of persistence, just through having that public spiritedness, that kind of social um, habit, if you like, um, really trying to push out the, the boundaries of what's possible, um, but through private initiative, through individual initiative. Yeah, that's a, that's a very positive sort of up, uh, optimistic note about, uh, you know, what, uh, what individuals and small groups of people can do when they're, when they're um, dedicated and public spirited and uh, want to make the world a better place. Yeah. So, so my guest today is Anton Howes. Uh, the book is Arts and Minds, How the Royal Society of Arts Changed a Nation, which I'll link to at the show notes page at economicsdetective.com. Anton, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Economics Detective Radio. As I mentioned at the end there, you can find a link to the book at economicsdetective.com. You can also find many other links there, including a link to my Patreon, where you can make a recurring donation uh, per episode uh, to support the show and to help offset the ongoing costs of running it. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back soon with another episode.